We are continuing our adventure here in Portland at the uh, Teardown event that Crowd Supply have put on, and uh, we're going to speak to uh, Mordos Paper Monitor. Now, we are all aware that e-ink is one of the more exciting ideas, but it is an exciting idea in the most part. If you ever tried to, say, put together a homegrown computer with an e-ink display, you probably got frustrated quite quickly because even these so-called high refresh rate e-ink displays aren't necessarily that great. Now, what Mordos have done to me is somewhat wizardry because they not only have got an incredibly high-resolution e-ink display working, it will work with a variety of e-ink displays, not only current ones, but ones that are legacy and older as well. So um, I hope I introduced that all right, but if there's anything you'd like to add, exactly where does Modos come from? What's the idea behind this? Well, from the beginning, it was the height of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I'm in my room, I'm working about 8 to 12 hours in front of a computer, mm -hmm. and I just couldn't do it anymore. Just a lot of uh, stress, uh, just having to multitask, having to be in front of the computer, and I was looking for another alternative that wasn't necessarily uh, blue light emitting displays. Mm -hmm. So I thought about it, had an e-reader, I'm like, why couldn't we shoot for making an e-ink laptop? Yeah. So initially uh, we were shooting for making an e-ink laptop and then since then we sort of focused on the foundation of being able to create a uh, display controller mm -hmm. and making available the uh, monitor that we're working on right now. Absolutely, yeah. And um, as I mentioned in the introduction, this is um, this is quite a wide-ranged idea. So, where did the uh, was the original idea to actually be able to be able to support a wide range of e-ink devices, or is that something that came together through the production of making this? I would say from it. Part of it is like to be able to provide um, has much compatibility with the existing screens that are available. Yes. Yeah, for sure, yeah. And I mean, this is, of course, a, a very important thing. There are a number of people out there who are trying to make use of the huge amount of uh, e-ink e waste that there is. Because a lot of, you know, a lot of displays, there are warehouses full of uh, second-party e-ink displays that aren't being used because there's four proprietary um, devices, right? Mm -hmm. But the idea is many of these are open and being able to be used. And as you showed me, you have a variety of displays here. But um, one of the things that we talked about briefly at the start was the, the utility of this for people. So what are the use cases you can see people using something like this for? Yeah, so we conducted a community survey and we saw a lot of results of people who had uh, visual impairments, people who have uh, migraines, people who have uh, epilepsy, uh, other folks who are like knowledge workers who uh, spend a lot of time reading, programming. So if you're someone who's in front of a computer for a long time or have some form of visual impairments or maybe want a, a distraction-free sort of environment, yeah. this may be part of it. And I think also DIY makers, people want to be able to build their own devices mm -hmm. and have an imagination of what, it, what they would want to do. So uh, we've built our own display controller. So uh, one of the benefits of that is that we can create our own particular modes of how we drive it. So with this mode, it switches between uh, black and white and also 16 level grayscale. So right now, uh, when I'm moving the mouse cursor or moving or scroll, I should say, you can see it moves very, very quickly. But the moment that I stop and zoom in a little bit, it does a flash, and now it does a 16 level uh, grayscale. So this is intended for people who are maybe uh, in front of a computer for a long time, who need to be able to find their position, provide them the lowest possible latency. Uh, then when it stops, provide the full 16 level grayscale to be able to read the particular document, whatever you're trying to do. Absolutely, and uh, obviously you've got this connected to a, a, a larger display just here, but what are a few of the other displays that you have here that you're showing off that this thing is compatible with? Yeah, so on towards your right over here, we have uh, both a uh, black and white screen, a different panel, but we also have uh, Kaleido 3. So it is uh, color e-ink, it uses a uh, color filter array, so uh, right now we have uh, bad, uh, what is it, bad, <laughs> sorry, Big Bad Bunny. Big Bad Bunny. But Big Bad Bunny that's showing with a color e-ink screen, and you can see right now that it's showing at its full 60 uh, FPS, uh, 60 frames, and able to see it fully. So um, that's just one example of the screens that we can drive. Uh, there's also other screens that as well that are uh, compatible from the back. Yeah, and uh, one final point that uh, I, I just really tickled me, because uh, not being from the US, I didn't realize that this kind of technology had made its way into vehicles. What exactly is this one back here? <laughs> so this one is, uh, if you've been visited California at any point, uh, they have uh, some vanity plates. Yeah. Uh, they're e-ink. Yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, one example of such plate. Absolutely. and um, but. Uh, 
I think for many people watching this, it'll be the, exactly the same thing as me. The exciting side of this is not only that this is something that is compatible with many different e-ink devices, it's the first thing that seems to make actually having an e-ink display that is usable on a daily basis for creatives, for example, um, a reality. So um, if people wanted to uh, look into this project, maybe find out how to back it or how to get a hold of one, what's the best way to find Modos? Yeah, so uh, Modos.tech, that'll be our main website. Uh, we're also running a crowdfunding uh, campaign with uh, CrowdSupply. So Modos Paper Monitor at CrowdSupply for the pre-launch page. Absolutely, and uh, both of these links will be in the description of this video below uh, or wherever you're seeing this. They'll also be on our blog. And uh, yeah, I, I, I've talked many times over the years about how exciting I find the way e-ink is changing and getting better and better, but this is a real significant step and um, I hope it's something that you find just as exciting as I do. We're still with Modus Paper Monitor. Uh, you've just heard about or uh, can find the interview which goes into the wider view of what this is and, uh, and in brief it is a board that allows you to turn a wide variety of e-ink displays into incredibly high refresh rate very usable screens. But I'm joined by Wenting to talk a little bit about the tech behind this because I was always under the impression uh, from my non-engineering background that the problem wasn't processing power the problem with e-ink displays is that there was a set time for refresh rates. Yes. How have you managed to get around that? Yes, the way to get around it, uh, for one, uh, we are using off-the-shelf screens, as you know, so we cannot change how slow the screen is. Yeah. The real thing is how we can compensate in the processing. Right? And here I have a very simple text editor up here, yeah. and uh, I set the font to maximum, so hopefully you can see it. Yeah. But say, one of the common things people want to do on ink is typing, so I look at typing first. Um, say you're just typing, say I type A, B, C, right? simple enough. And then, one thing that happens is, you see like, I type not, they don't, show up immediately, like they show as I type, right? It's A, then followed by B, then followed by C. So one of the thing that current or other in controller is doing is it has to wait for the for the thing to fully show up before I start working on the next thing. So if type A, then you know the screen takes say 100 milliseconds to show, the screen, uh, the controller waits for 100 milliseconds, then it will start displaying B, another 100 millisecond, and finally C. If I type really fast, then you can see the problem. Yeah. The controller always waits. Mm -hmm. So the first uh, technique I used is really just don't wait. Um, we keep all the timers, the timekeeping separate uh, up to each pixel. Yeah. Each pixel keeps its own time. So if you have multiple letters, if they are on different parts of the screen, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Right? And then, but this is not the whole solution. Yeah. You have still have another problem, say, I type A, I found oh, it's, it was a typo. I meant to type B, yeah. right? And then if I do it really fast, you, you see the problem is you have to wait 100 milliseconds to show up the A, then another 100 milliseconds to erase the A, another 100 milliseconds to show the B. Yeah. This couldn't be solved by just giving each pixel its own counter, because now they are on the same part of the screen. They are in the same part, yeah. uh, like same region. And then the solution is also kind of straightforward, I would say, as you see, it takes 100 milliseconds to drive the screen. If I only drive 50 milliseconds, then I could just drive another 50 milliseconds back instead of doing the whole thing. Yeah. And this is pretty much the other thing implemented there. Yeah. Of course, this is uh, the basic idea to get high refresh rate. Then on top, we did some other uh, tweaks and smaller stuff. Yeah. But, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, um, and I guess the, the uh, other question for the, on, in terms of the hardware side, um, is there any specific advantage you got by using an uh, FPGA as the basis for your driver? Does this give you good rigid timing guarantees or anything like that? Or is, there, is this something that could be achieved with another microcontroller? Or is, it, is this a very specific solution that you guys have come up with that requires using an FPGA? Yes, I would say FPGAs are not necessary. You can definitely do it with other stuff, for example, GPU, because uh, we know GPU is really good at processing pixels, exactly. and this is just processing pixels. Uh, my controller is a little bit too underpowered, because yeah, if yeah. you consider the screen has, say, 5 million pixels on it, and then you want to process these at 60 FPS, you, you get 300 million pixels per second. Your microcontroller only runs at 50 megahertz. It has no way of doing that. Um, but then the question really is why we chose FPGA instead of G using GPU. The reason is the thing we want to do relies, relies on pretty low level, but then usually the GPU API that's designed for you know, running graphical applications at high level. Yeah. It's possible that we 
you know, hijack into the kernel, we insert something into the GPU to do these things for us, but then they require separate solutions for different operating systems. Yeah. We want to build a universal solution that works on everything the user wants to use. Absolutely. That's why we chose FPGA. Absolutely. Yeah, and that makes absolute sense because it's, it's a custom-built solution that allows you to have multiple inputs and allows it to be widely used. Yeah, well, it's it's as, as I said in the previous interview, it's something that I find uh, very, very exciting, and uh, I really, really hope this works. As I, I as I also mentioned in the other interview, if you're interested in finding out more about the Modus Paper Monitor, you can find links to that under this video. We will have a blog post encompassing both of those videos if you'd like to see them side by side. Um, and uh, if you are interested in finding out more, head to their Crowd Supply page. You'll find links to that under this video.